Brother Mike. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 4. And Brother Mike, I'm going to catch you down, coming down this ramp here. And uh, <laughs> you were coming down the ramp. <laughs> Could you go to my office? And I left my notebook on my desk, front desk. <laughs> hey, it's the consequences of daylight saving time. I left it. You know, I, I'm doing that for y'all's benefit. I'm good, getting it. I if I don't get it, I'll be going from generation to revolution and <laughs> no telling where we'll end up, you know. But uh, some of these, uh, you know, you spend hours putting it together and then you walk up here and you left everything you did. <laughs> now you say, well, preacher, take the Bible and preach. Well, we could do that, but uh, we feel you'll more benefit if you, if, uh, you had the uh, had that which was actually put in, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do that. Hebrews chapter number four today, Hebrews chapter number four, and we're going to be reading there verses 14 through verse 16. Hebrews four, verses 14 through verse 16. The Bible says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may, be, may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, with your uh, hold that place and turn back to Hebrews chapter number two, if you would. Hebrews chapter number two and look at verse 17 because these two passages are truly connected. And it is uh, the completion of the thought that's been presented uh, in, in the first two chapters. In fact, uh, the whole idea is to tell these Hebrews that, uh, listen, uh, they were going a lot of persecution. They were dealing with a lot of pain. They had a lot of sorrow. Uh, they were uh, ostracized in their community. They were hated amongst their own brethren and also the Romans. And so they had and were dealing with things that uh, seemed at the time overwhelming and intense. And the whole idea was, was the Lord through the Holy Spirit was trying to communicate to them that as bad as things were, you got two of them just in case. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. He's a good deacon, isn't he? He really is. I appreciate that. Let's see if he got the right one. I don't know here. Hmm. I think you got the right one in this one, brother. I really do. I will preach one of these other ones out of here. You know what? That's all right. We're going to have to wing it today. Do you all mind? I mean, I, I, I don't know what's happened. I don't know. It's okay. Hey, we, we basically knew some of You might get out early. Who knows? We'll see. I, I, just, I don't know. These, it, could be, it could be on one of my desks, but check it out if you would, Don. I mean, Esther. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, we'll go on. We'll get, hey, listen, I, I don't forget all of it. But, uh, but if you look there in chapter number two and look at verse number uh, 17, it says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, three things have already been said about him. First, we looked, he said, we have a great high priest. And here it says we have a merciful high priest and a faithful high priest. Now, it, for the Gentiles, they weren't really all that familiar with priests. Uh, but yet, of course, as they got saved, they would come to know more about what the Jews uh, operated under and how they dealt with life. Uh, to the Jew, it was absolutely necessary to have a high, to have a priest, a high priest. In fact, Aaron was the prototype of the priest. He he was the first one, and and his role was that he would go in and and make intercession through the uh, sacrifice 
of, uh, of an innocent one, the, uh, the lamb, the blood of the lamb. He would go in once a year, one time before God, and have it poured on. Up through that time, that made for uh, uh, the moral, if you would, uh, equivalent of, of being right with God. Because although the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin forever... But the truth is, uh, he used that thing, and uh, the Jews depended on it. I mean, you got to have one to make intercession for you. And uh, you can just walk in like we do. We can go in uh, before the throne of grace individually because Peter says that all of God's people in the New Testament age are priests. And so for that reason, we walk right in and approach the throne of grace boldly. But not so in Old Testament times. And so he gives us three illustrations of what kind of priest the Lord Jesus was. We know who he's talking about because in Hebrews chapter 4 he said, Jesus, the Son of God. <laughs> it's not about some uh, religious figure. Oh boy, I saw that yesterday where the Pope said that the high-ranking Muslim cleric, the Koran, and no, uh, I mean, it, it baffles. No, it really doesn't, but it, it, it has a way of sort of waking you up uh, when you hear that. And somehow they were going to collaborate in order to uh, bring peace. Well, I'm going to tell you something. What that means is collaboration to wipe the Jewish nation off the face of the map. That's what that means. And to them, that's peace. Well, truth is, God's people aren't going anywhere. And when God made an everlasting covenant with Israel, he didn't mean it quit, went away. Uh, now, thank God, he, he set them aside and took up us Gentiles. <laughs> but he hasn't disbanded his everlasting covenant. And so uh, one day, uh, he's going to take up that country again, those people again. And, uh, but, but the priest was essential to all of them. And so he's a great high priest. Uh, he's a merciful high priest. Uh, and he's a faithful high priest. Notice this. In things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he tempted, that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. An old English word uh, to help. To assist, uh, we get our word uh, secure from it. And so he's laid out his role. He takes, uh, he takes our infirmities, our weaknesses, our temptation, and he understands them in that he also suffered temptation. Now I look at Hebrews chapter number 4 again, and just a couple of pages back there, and then you see that context in which we have verses 14 through verse number 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Now this time of year, you know, most of the sermons are going to be about uh, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this case, he admits here, uh, the writer of Hebrews, that he has already ascended under the heavens. Now, it also includes that he came down from heaven and he tab tabernacled himself in human flesh. And so he says, we have this great high priest. We have this way. And I guess we don't have a notebook. <laughs> hey, there's some folks, look around, there's some missing notes somewhere. And I'm going to tell you, there were some pretty good notes in there. I have to, I have to mention to you, uh, that's, that's uh, pr pretty unusual. Well, wait a minute. Here they are. <laughs> hey, do you, did any of y'all have a spare chair at your dinner table? <laughs> but as we think about the life, the death, the resurrection, he has an unequal life. There's no other life that can match his life. There's no doubt that he had a unique death, and we know that since the way he died. He not only died on Calvary, but he died for your sin and for my sin. And certainly we know he experienced, uh, if you would, a resurrection that can never be equaled. 
He was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you and I, one day, because of what he did for us, will opportunity experience likewise. Well, his death, burial, and resurrection, it's out there. I heard about this, a guy who, uh, you know, they were talking about the life of the Lord Jesus. And, and then uh, one, of his, one of the members was going through therapy sessions at a, a psychiatrist office. And in that particular group, there was about 100 people that gathered in this big, giant uh, conference room. And they were talking about failing and, you know, nobody's perfect, you know, and all that. And uh, somebody said, uh, the psychiatrist said, now, you know, I know all of you've got struggles and troubles and difficulties, but, but you know that there's none of us perfect. Nobody's perfect. And a fellow in the back uh, raised his hand and said, doctor. He said, yeah. He said, what? He said, I know somebody perfect. And the doctor said, well, now, who in the world would that be? And he said, my wife's first husband. <laughs> He's perfect. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Hey, listen, the sad thing about it is, you know who the only one perfect is? We have a high priest. He's without sin. He's tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, the truth is, uh, a lot of folks today who profess Christianity, uh, sad to say, don't even believe that. You know, they did a survey here about four years ago, and here's what the results were. 52% of professing Christians do not believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. Can you imagine that? I mean, that tells you where people are who profess Christianity. 52%. Now, the truth is today, if the Lord Jesus Christ didn't live a sinful life, then everything he said about himself cannot be true. I mean, if he did not live a sinless life, uh, he didn't do what he said he did. And if he didn't live a sinless life, there's no hope of you and I ever be delivered from sin. So thank God the Bible specifically says he was tempted in all points like as we are Yet without sin. I tell you, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and uh, disagreement uh, down through the ages in the theologians world. But uh, uh, what I believe the Bible teaches uh, here and for me is that he was divine in his nature, human and divine at the same time. I believe that Jesus came and tabernacled himself in human flesh. I do not believe he had a sinful nature or a fallen nature. I believe he had a body that uh, was sensitive to the temptations that every human being uh, deals with here. He, he, he suffered uh, and he was tempted as we are. Now, what does that mean? I've heard people say over the years, listen, I, I've heard all kinds, and you have two bizarre statements. Well, has Jesus ever been tempted with this sin and with that sin? And they come up with sometimes some awful scenarios, uh, sickening uh, views. But the truth is, our Lord Jesus had, had to deal with sin through the portals that man deals with them. Now, not all of us have the same sin. <laughs> There's so many, hey, there's more sins than there are people in the world. There are billions of sins. But our Lord Jesus dealt with sin through the way he described in his own word when he says the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Those are the portals that he was, he was tempted in all points. Those points. You know, every sin we commit. Every sin we commit falls under one of those categories. Every one of them. You can't name one. You can't enumerate one. You can't even consider one. Either way, it's going to come up under the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. When the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was tempted by the devil in Matthew, I believe, chapter number 4, you read that narrative right there, and you'll find that the devil appeared and appealed to the Lord in those three areas, he came to him. Jesus was 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. No doubt, his flesh hungered. And so the devil came to him and said, Listen, if you're God, 
the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. <laughs> See, the Lord was with the Father, communicating with him. And he tried, to, he tried to appeal to the flesh and what the flesh wanted. And the Lord said to him, Man shall not live by bread alone, but I, by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so he failed. Satan failed. And the Lord Jesus got victory in that he was tempted by the lust of the flesh, but yet without sin. There's no human being can say that. Now you and I know. Listen, sometimes uh, uh, we, we immediately cave into the lust of the flesh. I mean, there are times when you knew you shouldn't have ate that ice cream cone. You weren't supposed to. You got too many calories, your sugar's too high, and everything it tells you don't eat it. And somehow you pull up through and you see a short line in Dairy Queen. You know? And you go, whoa, I know I shouldn't eat this thing, but I'm going to eat it anyway. I tell you, that, that is a lust. It is not necessary to do it. It won't necessarily make your life any better or any longer. Consequently, more the opposite. But we cave in. Now, of course, it gets more serious, frivolous type stuff like that. But it shows you that the flesh does have these desires that are always good for you. And for the most part, many times, absolutely devastating to you. And so when he appealed to the, the Lord Jesus, Jesus took upon himself uh, the temptation of the lust of the flesh. And yet... Hebrews tells those Hebrew children, the writer says, you better recognize your great high priest. He wasn't like Aaron. Aaron had his own problems when he was chosen as the priest for the children of Israel there as they came out of Exodus. He had his own problems. He wasn't perfect. But the perfect one, he showed that even in the midst of an attack by Satan himself, he stood tall because he was without sin. He appealed to the lust of the flesh. Now, do you know, he, he sympathizes with us. No doubt about it. He says, we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He, he's somebody who can look at us, frail people, and he can sympathize with us. Now, empathy is... is maybe trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes to feel their pain. You hear this cliche today, we feel your pain. But sympathy is someone who actually experienced your pain. And so the word to have a high priest who can be touched with our infirmities, our weaknesses, he's experienced our pain. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, the lust of the flesh. And then, of course, the lust of the eyes, the devil took the Lord Jesus Christ up on the mountain, and the Bible says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. I always thought that was odd. It wasn't like the Lord Jesus didn't know about all those kingdoms. Hey, nothing ever happened that the Lord didn't know about. I mean, he, he wound up this old earth, and and turned it loose to a certain extent, and man did to it what he will. And so God was fully aware of the kingdoms of this world. In fact, there were more probably than Satan himself even knew about. And he said, hey, I'm going to show you these things, and you can have what your eyes see if you'll do what I tell you to do. You see, the eyes are ambitious. And sometimes the eyes, if not many times, in every life here has caused us to sin. I mean, we see and we want. I, I, I uh, uh, get a kick out of going to some of these places and they say, you know, immediately you walk in someplace, can I help you, can I help you? Well, how do I know? I, what do you got in here? Can I go see what you got here? It's like, give me a chance to see. And I always make the comment, hey, I'm going to look around. I might find something I didn't know I even needed. 
if I walk around here long enough. And so the lust of the eyes, it's the way we gain, we see. And truth is there's sin in that in some cases when we uh, begin to crave and we begin to envy. And so the Lord was dealt with by Satan in that sin. He saw that saw he said, look up all the kingdoms of the world, Satan said. And the Lord answered him accordingly. Yet he was without sin. And then, you know what he did in the final part. He said, why don't you do something foolish and throw yourself. He didn't use the word foolish, but he was actually foolish in suggesting it. Why don't you cast yourself off the side of this hill? And, uh, you know, why don't you play with God? Play with the Father. Said, you know, if you do that, uh, the word says he'll get his angels to bear the up. And the Lord could have done it, but he knew it was foolishness. It was irrelevant. And he said to him, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so there's the pride of life. The devil said, do something where it makes you look like a big shot. Do something supernatural. Do something where it appears to all the angelic beings uh, how magical your powers are. And God said, not necessary. God's got a plan, and I know his plan, and I'm going to do it straightforward, and I'm going to go to the cross, and nothing's going to hinder me. We have a high priest, a great high priest, a merciful high priest, a faithful high priest that knows our trouble. He's been tempted in all points such as we are, yet without sin. I tell you, there's an old illustration that the old timers used to give. I don't know much about music. I, excuse me. I don't know music very well. And uh, they say if you put two pianos very close by, that uh, if you hit a key, uh, they have uh, what they call sympathetic resonance, which if you hit a key, the, on the other piano, the same key will begin to vibrate. And uh, it's, it's called sympathetic resonance. So the Lord Jesus is sympathetic to our infirmity. In fact, that's what the book of Hebrews says. He says, for we have not a high priest in verse 15, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Jesus, in verse number 14, he says, it's Jesus, the Son of God. You should, you, we should never doubt who he is. There's no way to get around it. Now, somebody said, well, how in the world, uh, if, if I'm having problems with uh, 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 some immoral act, uh, how could Jesus ever uh, sympathize with me because he's never uh, been where I'm at subject to immorality and, and guilty of it? And the answer to that is this. Listen, uh, most brain surgeons, successful ones, neurosurgeons, they've done, a lot, they've done a lot of brain surgeries. I don't have to ask, have you ever had a brain surgery before you do mine? <laughs> and listen, that brain surgeon's experience is better than mine if I had it. <laughs> I, I'm not looking you know, I heard somebody talking about he was going to go into back surgery. They did locally here. And it turns out the guy doing the back surgery had uh, done hundreds and hundreds of back surgery. And, and the patient did ask and said, have you ever had back surgery? And the guy said, no, I haven't. That didn't discount him for that particular thing. He's dealt with more troubled backs than the person having the surgery ever did. And so it is with the Lord Jesus. Yeah, he's been touched with our infirmities. He doesn't necessarily have to have your particular sin, but he knows what portal it came through. He's already dealt with it. It is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And, it, and no doubt about it, his experience supersedes our in that he took upon himself 
the sin of the world, and he bare the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Hey, our Lord and Savior is a great high priest. He's a merciful high priest, and he's a faithful high priest. He confronts sin. In fact, I like what he said when a group of scribes and Pharisees were criticizing him and, and belittling him and mocking him about something. And he looked at him one day and he said, which of you convinces me of sin? <laughs> Jesus challenged his greatest critics who always would try to find fault with every little detail in his life and they could find no fault in him. <laughs> Because he had not sinned. It is important for uh, Christians to know that the Savior that you gave, uh, you trusted by faith, is one who's never sinned. Now he dealt with the temptation, but he never yielded. In truth, he did not have the fallen nature, but he felt the pain in his flesh that you and I feel. We know that. There are places in the scripture that tells about all the things that the Lord Jesus went through on our behalf. In fact, uh, there's a long list that people have come up with. He, he hungered, we know that. We know on Calvary, the Bible said he thirsted. He felt that pain. He had weariness. Hey, he had poverty. The Bible said, foxes have hole, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Hey, he had grief. Remember when he came to the place where Lazarus was and he had died? The Bible said that Jesus wept. In fact, another place in the scripture it says, and he was grieved with them, and it said, and angry because of their hardened hearts. It was righteous anger. It was God's repulsion of unbelief. So we know he's having to deal with all the things we've dealt with. He knows what it is to feel abandoned when, remember, he was preaching to the many he had fed through the loaves and fishes. And the Bible said when they heard his word, they said too much for us and they left him. I mean, we get tempted with that. Submission. He said to the Lord, to the Father, not my will, but thine be done. So he dealt with all the emotions. He was saddened. He was misunderstood. He was disappointed. He felt our infirmities, just like the word tells us. And yet, the victorious end of that, he stood. He stood against all com compromise in that he did not sin. No doubt today, when we look at all of the things that he did, he conquered. He conquered temptation. Now, isn't that what the apostle John said in 1 John when he said, little children, I command that you sin not. <laughs> You don't have to yield to temptation. Paul said, there's no temptation taking you but such is common to man, that God will provide a way of escape. But we know we have infirmities. <laughs> Jesus knows, and, and really, infirmities are weaknesses. In fact, another place the scripture says, he remembereth that their frame is but dust. <laughs> Hey, sad to say, we're in a heap of trouble. We're admonished and taught in the scripture not to sin, but we're weak in our frame and subject to our infirmities. And so what happens if he, if he suffered like us, tempted in all points like as we, recognizes our weaknesses, and yet he did not sin. Well, where does that leave us? Because we do sin, sadly to say. Well, the answer, of course, if we do sin, if we confess our sin, if any man 
has a sin, confesses it, he is faithful. He's the faithful high priest and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I guess the whole idea today was to communicate this, that our Lord and Savior, if you're a born-again Christian today, you, your Lord and Savior has blazed the trail ahead for you. He has felt what you feel. He has experienced the things you've experienced even this week where you've said, where is God? How come God didn't come to my rescue? Why hasn't God kept me and got me out of this mess? Why has he let me stay in this situation? The Lord has dealt in his own self all of the things you felt. And yet, he never doubted. He never rebelled. He said, Lord, Father, not my will, but thine. He suffered in all points. The difference between you and him and me and him, he was without sin. Hey, we have a great high priest. You know what he does for us right now? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive our sins. Hey, even our everyday infirmities as believers... The Bible says we have an advocate with the Father. He's actually acting as our defense lawyer, pleading the case that we've been washed in his blood. Hey, we've been cleansed from all iniquity. He pleads that for us. You know, I heard a story uh, in closing about a fellow who was preaching up in Chicago at one big Salvation Army a campaign years ago at the turn of the century in the early 1900s. And he got up there and he preached this very text. Hey, we have a high priest that can sympathize with us, who feels our pain. And after the service, a disheveled young man met him at the front. It's been looked like he'd been through a nightmare. And he said, Preacher, you preach that. But you tell me, I just buried my wife yesterday and I've got three little kids right now crying for their mama. Are you going to tell me that he cares for me, that he sympathizes with me? Where is he? If it had happened to you, you wouldn't be preaching that. Hey, sadly, a week later, the preacher who had preached that, wife perished in a train wreck. And when they, the very next week, brought her body back to the very hall where he preached in to have her funeral, that preacher got up and said, if you're here today, fella, I'm here to tell you I have a high priest that is aware of my weakness and my failure. And he has come to my rescue. Oh, my heart is crushed, he said. My soul is sad. But there's still a support. He has secured me in the midst of my temptation. In fact, one writer said, when it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in, the, in time of need. He said, he makes it to us in the nick of time in the nick of time. I hope today you know him as your Savior. Listen, if you do, you ought to be grateful of who he is. He's fantastic. He's beyond understanding, but he is merciful, faithful, and great. Let's bow our heads together if you would. We're going to have a song of invitation this morning. If you're here today and you've never met him as your high priest, as your savior, as your faithful sacrifice. He died on Calvary. He did give himself for you. He's already suffered the temptation of humanity, but he never sinned. And now he offers to you a sympathetic understanding. And he says, I'll give you your help in your time of need. I'll give it to you. You can count on me.
But to the child of God, we've got to come to Him in our time of need. You know, folks, people come to everybody else but the Lord. We come to each other, we complain, we gripe, we moan to other people. But listen, we need to come to Him to obtain grace in the time of need. If you're without the Lord Jesus today, I invite you to come by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He will save you if you'll trust him. Lord, we pray the Holy Spirit of God would take what we have. Take this book, use it in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together if you would. We're going to sing a verse or so of page three.